Good evening, everyone. So the last time that we discussed Revelation, uh, Adam talked a bit about the first beast from chapter 13. And how drawing heavily on imagery from Daniel, the author of Revelations, John, portrays the Roman Empire as a sort of amalgamation of the four beasts from Daniel. Now, it's seven heads and ten crowns were probably a reference to Julius Caesar, the five emperors of the julio claudian dynasty, and the year of four emperors that were where there were simultaneous claims to the throne from different parts of the empire. So you get your seven heads and ten crowns. But before John moves on to the second piece, he adds this little aside in verses 9 and 10. Let anyone who has an ear listen. If you are to be taken captive, into captivity you go. If you kill with the sword, with the sword you must be killed. Here is a call for endurance and faith, the saints. Now, that's the NRSV rendering. If you were happening to be reading this in a translation like the NIV, you may have noticed that verse 10 is translated somewhat differently. <laughs> Instead, it reads, if anyone is to, is to be killed by the sword, with the sword they will be killed, which completely changes the meaning of the verse. Rather than being a call to nonviolent endurance, it becomes a statement about people's destiny or fate. Now this turns out to be because what's called a textual barrier, meaning that different ancient manuscripts had slightly different uh, variations in how this was presented. A different word here or a skipped line there, usually pretty inconsequential. But every once in a while, like here, it actually matters. And it may or may not shock you to learn that out of dozens of manuscripts that we have of this passage, a grand total of one <laughs> supports the NIV. <laughs> Granted, it is Codex Alexandrinus, which is generally considered a really good source, but I mean, still, come on. And it seems like maybe there was a, just a little bit of bias in picking and choosing here. Like maybe the call to nonviolent endurance didn't sit well with certain committees. So they decided that this must be a reference to Jeremiah 15, even though the Greek of Revelations 13 doesn't remotely match the Septuagint of Jeremiah 15, except for. Two words that are not even in the same uh, order or the same grammatical form. Rather than seeing it as a reference to Genesis 9-6, or Jesus' teaching in Matthew 26-52, or simply being John's own word for the faithful. Any of which would be more plausible than dozens of other scribes, all making similar mistakes independently of each other. Uh, all right, that's, <laughs> that's enough of the textual criticism. Uh, let's move on to John's next section. Now, for context, after the fall of the julio claudian dynasty, the Flavian dynasty was the one to come to power. And compared to figures like, say, Nero, they were rather unexcited. And I mean that in the best possible way. I mean, they weren't feeding Christians to wild beasts or crucifying them for punsies or setting them on fire to light their garden party, all of which numbered among Nero's hobbies. Instead, they tried, by Roman standards at least, to be good rulers and decent human beings. 
And now, don't get me wrong, they were absolutely ruthless to their enemies. But at least by the morality of the empire, they sought to be ruthless and fair. Domitian even repealed the law that made it a crime to demean the emperor. When asked why he had done this, he responded, because I have resolved to do nothing of which I am ashamed, and to care nothing for false reports. In fact, the Flavian dynasty was so boring that they are known primarily for a series of financial reforms. I mean, Roman coins have been debased over the years in an attempt to pad the empire's coffers. You know, mix in a little lead with your gold or a little tin with your silver. But Domitian issued new coins with a fraction of the impurities in an effort to strengthen the Roman currency. I mean, if, if Nero was a sadist, then Domitian was a policy wonk. So after the horrors of Nero, what glowing terms is John going to use to describe this next administration? Well, let's read from Revelation 13. Then I saw another beast that rose out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast on its behalf, and it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. It performed great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in the sight of all. And by the signs that it is allowed to perform on behalf of the beast, it deceives the inhabitants of earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast could even speak and cause those who would not worship the image to be killed. Also, it causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, both slaves and free, to be given a brand on their right hand or on their forehead, so that no one can buy or sell who does not have the brand, that is, the name of the beast or the number for its name. This calls for wisdom. Let anyone with understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a person, and its number is 666. So maybe glowing isn't the right term. <laughs> Stated might be closer. I mean, sure, compared to leaders such as Caligula or Nero, the Flavians were fantastic emperors. But it turns out that Nero wasn't John's basis for comparison. Apparently, it's really easy to look good when being compared to a sadistic, narcissistic man child with near unlimited power and nearly zero accountability. But Maybe it's a mistake to simply be comparing this emperor to the last emperor. Maybe our standards should be a little bit higher than just not an insane, murderous, matricidal sociopath like Nero. So let's go back and take a somewhat more critical view of the Pleiades. The first of the Flavian dynasty was Emperor Vespasian. And one of his first acts was to crush the Jewish rebellion that had been going on during the last four years or so of Nero's reign. Vespasian sent his eldest son, Titus, who would himself one day end up being emperor, to do the deed. Now, Titus decided that to put pressure on the food and water supplies of Jerusalem, he would wait until all of the pilgrims had entered the city during Passover, and then surround the city and lay siege. 
Then he crucified his prisoners of war around the city walls in order to demoralize the rebels. Now after that, the city fell relatively quickly. They starved out pretty quick. And Titus leveled the city. He burned the temple to the ground and declared that no one would even remember the name Jerusalem. Now he did all of this despite actually having a Jewish wife. And when offered the wreath of victory for his conquest, he actually refused it, saying that the victory wasn't his, but that he was simply the vehicle through which the Jewish God had punished his people. Unlike Nero, he seems not to have relished his task. But just like Nero, he carried it out all the same. Now, this is probably what John was talking about when he says that the second beast made fire come down from heaven to earth in the sight of all. Talk about the burning of the temple. Thus, the second beast finished what the first beast had started. Now, I also mentioned some of the economic reforms that the Pleiadians became known for. Now, part of this was an attempt to defend the Roman currency from debasement. But the Pleiadians also realized something else. They thought of each Roman coin as a tiny little billboard. It was something that people saw and used and thought about on a daily basis. Now, Roman coins had borne the image of the Roman gods and emperors for quite a while, but under the Flavians, the images and words on them became more propaganda, more propaganda than vanity projects. They printed on their coins how they wanted the empire to be perceived, and how they wanted the emperors to be perceived. Past and present. In fact, one might almost say that no one can buy or sell anything without literally buying in to the propaganda of the empire. Deuteronomy 6 reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are awake, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand and fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on the gates. Now, in other words, the greatest and first commandment to Israel was that Yahweh and Yahweh alone was God. Yahweh and Yahweh alone was to be loved and worshipped with all that we are. That fact was to guide all of our actions found on the hand and all of our thoughts placed on the forehead. And all of our household doings written on the doorpost and the gate. And to John, buying into the propaganda of the state was allowing the name of the beast to guide our thoughts and actions. And that's exactly what the Flavians were trying to accomplish with their propaganda campaigns. That every time someone would buy or sell, they would, in some small way, be doing so in the name of the empire. Now, all of that gives the background for how that 
first audience of Revelation would have heard this passage. But I don't think that this would be in the scriptures if this were merely a history lesson in code. You see, the part of the power of apocalyptic literature, much like the power of parables, is that it has something to say to every generation. The interpretation and reinterpretation of these texts is central to how they function. Because they deal not just with the specifics of first century Palestine, but rather with patterns that play out again and again throughout the centuries. I, people have often obsessed over identifying the beast in Revelation. But that seems a little bit like trying to identify the prodigal son in Jesus' parable. You kind of risk missing the point. The beast was alive and well long before Nero drew breath. And it's remained with us long after Domitian passed away. The patterns at play here are not unique to five or six decades of the Roman Empire. Now, I'm emphatically not saying that we should try to identify the beast today. But what I am saying is that in a deep way, every culture, every government, every force that demands we place our loyalty to it above our loyalty to God has been beastly. Even the comparatively good ones. Our loyalty to the Lamb and our struggle, our loyalty is to the Lamb and our struggle is against the dragon and whatever beast he raises from the sea. Now, I know that we've discussed before how strange apocalyptic literature can appear when, we're, when we aren't steeped in the symbols that are being used. So I wanted to close by trying something a little strange tonight. <laughs> um, I've written something in an apocalyptic style that draws on symbols in our own era. And I'd like to see if it seems a little less weird to you when you have a more intuitive grasp of the language and symbols involved. So here goes my <laughs> the spirit of the Lord took me up and showed me a great city where the people never slept. In the distance, I saw a great golden calf. And as the people of the city bowed down and worshipped the calf, it grew into a great bull. And suddenly there appeared a bear whose fur shone like bronze, equal in strength to the bull. And the bull and the bear fought in the streets of the city and trampled upon the people. And the bull, when the bull would prevail, the people would sacrifice to it the poor from among them and say, great is the bull who brings us prosperity. And when the bear would prevail, the people would sacrifice their children to the bear and say, fearful is the bear who must be appeased. Okay, so who here has absolutely no idea what aspect of our culture I might have been in? <laughs> All right. I mean, the thing is, the images that I was using were as objectively weird as anything in Revelations. Or Daniel, for that matter. But did they seem as weird? Did they seem as confusing? Seems that your um, reading strikes me as producing the uh, Wall Street. Yeah. 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 All those things. yeah. Yeah, that was the the intended symbols, the, the economy, the markets. 
um, and the way those are almost worshipped. Yeah. And I could have criticized dozens of aspects of our culture in the same way using the symbols that are uh, associated with different aspects of our culture. Uh, I actually wrote three or four different of these. <laughs> this, uh, I cut the other ones in part for time, and I thought that one got the point across. But uh, I mean, I could easily pick our culture's views on money, violence, sex, racism, you name it. The list goes on. So now I would like. To one more thing, if you guys are willing. One little exercise. I want each of you to write something in this style. Uh, you have the paper that we passed out with the calendar on it, so if you extra piece of paper up here, it would be fun. Um, but spend a minute thinking about the ways that our culture con conflicts with God's character. And pick one thing to write about. And if you're feeling really, really brave, ask yourself, what's the biggest way that our culture tends you to divide your loyalty? 